you will learn how to diagnose and manage common diseases and pests that can spoil the fruit in your home orchard. Okay, let's talk more specifically about what I'm going to try to cover tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some diseases. We're going to start with diseases. And my goal tonight is to tell you enough about these diseases, uh, what signs and symptoms are going to show up on your trees if uh, one of these diseases infects it, uh, what to do about it if uh, an infection develops, and also uh, what to do to try to prevent the disease. We're going to start with eutypa disease. Um, the primary fruit trees that it infects are apricots and cherries. Uh, then we'll move on to leaf curl. You might have heard it called peach leaf curl, but it also affects nectarines. Uh, it was pretty bad this year because uh, it's a fungal disease. Uh, it gets really going good uh, when it's very rainy. So the rainy year that we had last year really increased uh, the prevalence of it. So we'll talk about leaf curl and then we'll move on to fire blight. Uh, very devastating, particularly for pears. I see a few of you have got quince uh, in your home orchard also can affect that, uh, as well as apples. Uh, then uh, uh, after fire blight, we're gonna do the first Q&A. So be sure that you put any questions on those first uh, three diseases into the Q&A before we finish up discussing fire blight. Uh, then the final disease that we'll talk about is shot hole another fungal disease, and it uh, affects a lot of the stone fruits, apricots, nectarines, peaches, and sometimes plums and cherries as well. Then we'll talk about uh, managing the codling moss. That's what causes those wormy apples. Uh, and then we're going to finish up uh, with uh, some suggestions about uh, dormant season spraying. Dormant season is when your trees have lost their leaves and are really taking a rest over the winter months. Uh, but the uh, overwintering aphids, scale, and mites uh, are there, and uh, it's a good time to try to get those under control. So you type a disease. Uh, we're starting with you type a disease, um, and we scheduled this webinar in August because. One of the first takeaways that I want you to have from this program is if you've got apricot or cherry trees, uh, you should be doing your pruning on them uh, before the end of this month. And why is that? Well, you type of disease is a fungal disease. Uh, it can actually, uh, if left unmanaged, it can kill your apricot and cherry trees. It also, uh, is a big problem in commercial grape growing, so it can affect your grapes as well, and occasionally it affects um, almonds. Uh, the photo is showing uh, an orchard uh, where an apricot tree uh, has one of its limbs dying from the disease. So how do you know if you've got eutypa? Well, if you're unfortunate enough to have eutypa start, what the first thing you'll probably notice are that the leaves on the infected branch don't look right. They're undersized, they're faded in color, a little bit wilted, uh, as shown in the photo. Uh, the uh, disease actually progresses fairly slowly. It's a fungal disease that is moving into the vascular system of the tree. The vascular system is what uh, transports all the uh, water from the roots and all the sugars that are produced during photosynthesis. Uh, if your tree uh, has an infection, uh, in a couple of years, you're going to start seeing uh, cankers develop. So this is fairly slow moving. Uh, you might notice the small leaves, et cetera, that I showed on the prior slide. And it might be a couple of weeks or a couple of years before you notice the cankers and also the gumming. 
Uh, the cankers are what I've shown with the blue arrows on the left, that's apricot, and the cherry tree on the right with the yellow uh, arrow on it, that's pointing to a gummy substance that comes out of the cankers. Those are signs of eutypa disease. Uh, it can, if left unmanaged, it can kill the uh, branch of a tree, as you see here, and eventually it can spread throughout the tree. So you really want to manage it. The important thing uh, to understand is that it primarily is going to spread uh, through splashing water. That's why we recommend uh, that you get the apricots and cherry trees pruned this month. Uh, they'll take six to eight weeks to heal up those uh, pruning wounds. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, they'll be healed before we start our um, uh, winter rainy season. Uh, also be sure once you've pruned them, keep the sprinklers away from them because the uh, spores can infect through those uh, pruning wounds. Now, the important thing to understand is, uh, yes, it is the case that apricot and cherries and then maybe grapes and uh, almonds are the most vulnerable, but there are a lot of different trees and shrubs as well that can have the uh, pathogen the fungal spores that cause the disease, but show no symptoms. It doesn't harm them. They're not going to have the dieback. Uh, so if you have any of the following trees, either in your own yard or a neighbor's yard, they could have the fungal disease that could spread to your apricots or cherries. Uh, apples certainly uh, harbor it. Uh, crab apples, blueberries, so bushes as well as uh, trees, honeysuckle, uh, kiwi, oleander can harbor it, pears, and also certain native plants like the California buckeye, ceanothus, and willow. So um, those are the trees that harbor it. It can spread to your cherry and apricot. It's going to infect it through wounds. Usually those are pruning wounds, but also be careful. If you've got weed whackers, for example, uh, be careful uh, not to be cutting through the bark on your cherry and uh, apricot trees. It could be an entry point for the fungal spores. Uh, and just to repeat, to reduce the risk of infection, you should be pruning your apricots and cherries this month. So what happens if you've got a, an infection? You've seen those uh, leaves in the springtime not looking quite right. Maybe you're starting to see some uh, cankers forming on the branch and some uh, weeping through it, the gamosis. Uh, well, what you're gonna wanna do is when you start noticing those symptoms, you want to prune out the infected branch. Uh, in this case, it's a pretty large branch, and I've marked with the blue arrow uh, the canker that is closest to the trunk of the tree. Uh, you want to find that canker spot, and then you want to go a foot uh, below it or all the way back to where it joins onto the main trunk of the tree. Uh, that's going to slow it moving. Uh, from this branch into the trunk itself where it could affect the rest of the tree. So uh, you're going to cut it uh, at least a foot below uh, where you see the canker and then take a look at the cut that you've made. In this case, uh, the wedge-shaped uh, kind of dark area that's inside the branch, that is indicating that there's still a eutypa infection in that branch. So if you see that uh, after you've done your pruning, you want to make another cut further down. Uh, be sure when you're uh, cutting off the uh, infected branches uh, that you dispose of it in the garbage, not even in your green bin, because there is a risk uh, that it's going to spread to all the other hosts and you want to try to keep it out of uh, even your compost. 
uh, disinfect your pruning to tools between each cut. And when we talk about fire blight, uh, which is really an issue for cleaning your pruning tools, I'll give you some further recommendations how to clean them. Peach leaf curl. If you've got peaches or nectarines, chances are pretty good that you saw peach leaf curl on your tree uh, this past springtime. And if you ask us, either at one of the Ask a Master Gardener uh, tables at the uh, farmer's market, or you wrote in to us at the help desk, uh, we told you back in March or April, well, there's really nothing you can do about it now. Just uh, expect those leaves to fall off, pick them up, get them out of your yard. Uh, but this is what it looks like uh, when it's um, infecting the tree in the springtime. And understanding its life cycle will help you understand when and how you manage it. Uh, it's called uh, caused by a fungus, Tephena deformans. Uh, it uh, commonly appears about two weeks after the leaves first come out. The leaves look just normal when they first emerge, but then they get the wrinkled kind of reddish curl uh, to them. Uh, also uh, in a bad year, uh, it's also going to infect uh, some of the flowers and some of the shoots where uh, your uh, peaches uh, or nectarines ought to be growing. Uh, the photo is actually one in my neighbor's yard. Uh, her peach tree kind of overhangs uh, my fence. She's uh, nice enough to uh, share those peaches with me, but unfortunately it had bad peach leaf curl this year and uh, you can see that one of the uh, flower shoots actually died as a result of it. So usually what will happen is those infected leaves are gonna fall from the tree, uh, they'll regrow, and usually the tree is gonna produce a crop. Uh, only occasionally will you see symptoms showing up on the fruit. Usually the fruit is unblemished, it looks just fine. But if you see kind of the corky spots that are shown in the photo, uh, that is an indication that the peach leaf curl spread into the fruit itself. So it's also important to understand what's gonna happen uh, <clears throat> during the summer months. Uh, so it's a fungal disease the fungal spores uh, really multiply uh, in rainy conditions. That's why it was so rampant this year. Uh, but during the summer, it's actually in a non-reproducing asexual spore on all the tree surfaces. So it's gonna be on those fallen leaves, it's gonna be on the uh, twigs, on the blossoms. Uh, what you want to be sure to do in the summer is pick up all those leaves that fell from it, get them out of your garden, because they will have spores that will uh, be on their surfaces. Uh, when it rains, uh, the spores come back to life. They become uh, more multiple. They start uh, spreading. And if you don't treat it, uh, the spores are probably going to infect the leaves and the flowers the following spring. Uh, over time, it really can weaken the tree. Here's a photo of a uh, peach tree in an orchard that's actually died as a result of having a untreated case of peach leaf curl. Uh, so what do you do about it? If you've got uh, if you've had uh, problems in the springtime with the uh, peach leaf curl showing up, uh, you're going to want to use a copper fungicide spray in the dormant season. So what you're going to be looking for is just go to any uh, nursery, big box stores, or even on your um, online uh, sellers uh, and look for a copper fungicide. There's many of them out there. I've shown a few pictures. These are frankly pictures that um, I was able to make myself just by visiting local nurseries and taking pictures of the labels. 
what I really want to point out is not that you're going to buy any particular brand. We don't recommend any particular brand. Uh, one copper spray, its active ingredient is the copper. It's going to act just like any other uh, uh, copper fungicide. Uh, but the percentage of copper is important. Uh, I've circled uh, on each of the labels what the percentage are, and I put it down below to make it easier to read. Uh, three of the five have 8%. 8% is currently the maximum amount of copper uh, that the uh, uh, fungicides are allowed uh, by law to contain. It used to be up to 50%, and frankly, those uh, times back before 2010, when I became a master gardener, they were more effective. But be sure you look for one that's got 8%. Uh, the abbreviation MCE stands for metallic copper equivalent, and you'll find it on the labels. Just uh, buy one for this purpose and any of the other uh, times that I recommend copper fungicide, you want one that has at least 8%. You can also make it more effective by adding a horticultural spray oil. And at the uh, very end of this presentation, I'm gonna be talking quite a bit more about spray oils. Uh, but what they do is they help the fungicide stick to the tree, making it more effective. Uh, and it's just 1%. Uh, if you are using a fungicide spray, let's say that you've got a quart of spray because you've got uh, multiple trees that you're going to be treating with it. A uh, quart has 192 teaspoons. So 1% uh, is only about two teaspoons to be added to a quart of your uh, fungicide spray. Uh, it'll just make it more effective. Uh, before you uh, spray, you wanna uh, wait until the leaves have fallen. You might even have to help them if they're slow falling off the tree, then clean them up because they're another reservoir uh, for the spores. Uh, and you wanna get them out of your garden before springtime. You also wanna prune your trees. Uh, we're talking about nectarines and peaches. Uh, they both uh, grow pretty uh, vigorously during the uh, spring time. They'll put on a, uh, out a lot of new wood. Uh, the wood that is growing this season is where your peaches are going to grow next year. Uh, but typically you want to get out 50 to 60 percent of the new growth uh, by pruning before you do your spraying, you're really reducing the amount of any overwintering spores that are on the surface of the tree. Uh, there's less tree to uh, have to treat, and it's a, a good time to get the pruning that should be done annually uh, completed anyway. So prune first. Uh, then you're going to spray with the copper fungicide, probably with a little mineral oil added to it. You're going to do that twice. Uh, first one, uh, just after Thanksgiving, uh, and then once again in February, maybe you think Valentine's Day or thereabouts, just before the buds uh, start uh, opening on the tree is the time for the second one. Uh, be sure that you pick times when it's not going to rain because the copper fungicide uh, adhering to the tree is going to be killing those overwintering spores. That's what you're trying to accomplish. So you don't want it to quickly get washed off uh, by uh, a rainy day. Uh, if you're not yet uh, growing peaches or nectarines, but you think you would like to, uh, you might try to uh, find a variety that's got some resistance. Uh, I've named them here on the slide. Uh, also note the notes I've included, if you pick the variety called frost for the first two or three years after you plant it, you should go ahead and do the fungicide uh, spraying uh, preventively. It takes a while for the its resistance to kick in. And then one of the varieties, the Indian free, is an heirloom variety. Uh, 
most peaches and most nectarines don't need to have another nearby tree in order to uh, pollinate. But Indian free is an heirloom variety that requires cross-pollination by another tree. And then I've included the name of one resistant nectarine as well. Uh, those names, by the way, will be uh, on the handout that you can obtain after the presentation. So now we're going to move on to fire blight. Uh, fire blight, uh, this one's not fungal. This one's actually bacterial. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, is the pathogen that's going to cause the uh, problem. Uh, it uh, is very much uh, prevalent both on European pears uh, and uh, Asian pears, uh, also can affect uh, apples. Uh, and in addition to those fruit trees, it can also be an issue uh, for uh, uh, the uh, ornamental versions. So if you've got an ornamental pear tree, it can be uh, attacked by fire blight as can uh, a number of uh, other kind of trees. Loquat uh, trees can be affected uh, and pyracantha and hawthorn shrubs uh, can also have fire blight. Uh, so any of those are a, a potential source of the bacteria that's going to cause the problem. Uh, it's pretty easy to recognize. Uh, chances are, if you um, haven't seen it before, the first thing you're going to notice are a lot of dead leaves on a branch on the tree just hanging on there. Uh, the leaves seem to die, but they stay uh, on the tree. Uh, but if you uh, were really observant of your trees, uh, you could even earlier than the dieback of the leaves uh, notice uh, an oozing out of cankers uh, that form where an infection has entered the tree. Uh, it's called a bacterial ooze. Uh, it's pretty small, inconspicuous at the beginning. Uh, the blue arrow is pointing it uh, out on the slide. Uh, as it progresses, it will kill back the leaves. Usually on an apple tree, they are kind of a dead brown color. On pears, it's more likely to uh, actually turn out black. And as you can see in the photo, in addition to infecting uh, the leaves and causing them to die, this one has also killed uh, a young developing pear on the tree. Uh, it can uh, be confused. Uh, fire blight can be confused with another bacterial disease. Uh, this one's called uh, blossom blast. Uh, this is actually a photo of blossom blast uh, occurring on my Fuji apple tree in my backyard. Uh, it's uh, there. I pointed it out with the arrow. Uh, the difference between blossom blast and fire blight is blossom blast usually is confined just to the blossom uh, and the spur where the fruit was developing. It'll kill a few leaves. Uh, what you ought to do if you see blossom blast, take a quick, uh, close look at it. Um, if if you're not seeing any bacterial uh, ooze, if it seems like it's just uh, limited to a small area of the tree, it may be blossom blast. Go ahead, when you see this happening, uh, prune it out. But let's talk about the life cycle of the uh, fire blight, because again, it helps inform the management. Uh, the bacteria is going to actually overwinter in cankers uh, on the branches of the uh, tree. Uh, so um, in a minute, I'm going to tell you that uh, for certain trees, you should try to get those, get rid of those during the summer. Uh, but if you either fail to do that or don't notice it, that's where the uh, bacteria is going to be uh, overwintering. In spring, uh, when the sap starts moving in the tree, 
uh, bacteria can multiply and uh, you'll start seeing the bacterial ooze coming out of cankers on the tree. Uh, and then uh, rain or insects uh, can spread it to the flowers uh, on your tree. Uh, when the bees visit, if they pick it up, uh, the bacteria, they can spread it to other flowers on the tree. So it can move from one area of your tree to another or to other nearby uh, vulnerable trees. Uh, at the same time that it is infecting new areas uh, uh, by pollination or even uh, things like rain or wind, it can also be spreading inside the branch uh, that is infected where the oozing occurs. Uh, the infection uh, develops in the vascular system uh, of the pear tree or the apple tree and it spreads towards the trunk of the tree as much as two or three feet below a visible uh, canker. Uh, it spreads very quickly inside an infected branch when the trees are growing rapidly. And when is that? That's usually in the springtime. So in order to reduce the uh, growth rate, slow down the growth rate a little bit so you're slowing down the movement of the infection inside the branches of a pear tree. Uh, in the springtime, don't fertilize with a nitrogen fertilizer either before or during the blooming season. Uh, if you've had fire blight uh, uh, in the past, uh, get in the habit of doing any fertilizing uh, mid to late summer, uh, not in the early springtime, which is just going to spur the growth and therefore the movement of the infection in the tree. Also, uh, don't heavily prune your trees in the dormant season. Um, uh, pruning in the winter is going to spur a lot of uh, growth in the springtime. Uh, it's often a good idea if you're trying to control control the size of your uh, fruit trees to do summer uh, pruning when it's not going to uh, spur uh, that rapid new growth. Uh, also, uh, pear and apple trees don't necessarily need a lot of pruning. Uh, they produce their uh, fruit on uh, spurs that uh, will last and produce fruit. If they don't become infected with a disease, uh, they, they, they can uh, produce fruit for 10 to 15 years. Also, uh, don't be irrigating uh, during the bloom. Uh, again, that's just going to make things uh, move more quickly inside the vascular system and spread any existing disease. And then monitor uh, your trees frequently uh, to look uh, for any uh, tan uh, oozing that's coming from the uh, branches. That's an early sign of infection. Uh, if you notice infections in the springtime, if it's a pear or quince, uh, it's going to spread very quickly in the tree. Uh, so uh, in the springtime, go ahead and remove those infections right away as soon as you see the um, oozing. Uh, apples, it depends on the variety. Uh, here I've listed the highly susceptible apples uh, that can have bad cases of fire blight. Uh, other varieties, it's going to spread more slowly. And instead of having to rush to do it as soon as you notice it, uh, you can uh, do your pruning a little later in the season. The reason you would want to do that is that in the springtime, uh, in the uh, pear and quince and certain apples, it's moving very quickly. You have to be very careful as you're pruning because you don't want to be uh, pruning branches that has some of that bacterial ooze and then spreading it to other areas on the tree. So if you're spreading in the, if you're uh, doing the pruning uh, to remove infections during the springtime, uh, be sure that you use uh, good pruners that are very sharp and disinfect them between each cut. Uh, to disinfect, you can use a bleach solution, 10% uh, bleach, so 
one part water, nine parts, or excuse me, one part uh, bleach and nine parts water. Uh, you can use a product like Lysol. Some of us learned uh, during the pandemic that Lysol can kill pathogens and you can use it on your pruners. But my strong preference is to use alcohol, uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, you find it just at a drugstore. Any brand is going to work. Uh, you want something that's got at least 70%. It goes up to 100. Uh, the label that I happen to have on my alcohol in my uh, cupboard was 91%. So that's what you're seeing on the screen. I put it in a very small glass uh, spray bottle. Uh, so it's very easy for me just to spray the um, uh, pruners. You could also use alcohol wipes, those kind of little alcohol uh, patches that they use uh, before you're having a shot or uh, giving blood uh, to clean the skin. You can use those to clean your pruners. Just be sure you uh, change to a clean one each time. Now, the reason I really prefer the alcohol is that um, if you spray it on your pruners, it only takes about 10 seconds to kill bacteria. Uh, and it's not gonna be corrosive to your pruners. Um, if you use Lysol, it's also not corrosive, uh, but it's going to take three minutes uh, to kill the bacteria that uh, causes uh, uh, the fire blight. And uh, the bleach, even longer. Uh, at 10 minutes is recommended. I've seen recommendations online for as much as 30 minutes. And you have to be very careful uh, to clean and oil your pruners because it's corrosive. So you might want to do what I do and just take the, take the easy way and use some alcohol. Uh, if you're going to uh, be removing the infection in the spring, uh, what you want to do to find where you're going to cut uh, is to look at uh, the visible infection. Uh, where do you see any uh, browning on the branch, any cankers, any oozing? Uh, then measure about 8 to 10 inches lower on the branch or back to where the branch is connecting with a larger branch or with the tree. And you're going to cut it back that far. Uh, if you don't uh, get the whole infection removed, it's going to continue to spread down through the wood. Uh, I actually uh, have pear trees, both European pear tree and a, uh, Asian pear tree. Uh, the European pear tree in particular had bad fire blight uh, last summer. Uh, when I pruned it, I didn't get it all out. So I went back uh, in the dormant season after all the leaves were gone. I found the cankers and then uh, I uh, scraped off the bark. Uh, you can see here that uh, the darker area uh, higher up on the branch is the bottom of the visible infection. And what you want to do is prune six to 10 inches below that visible infection. Uh, so be sure, uh, you know, check your trees this uh, spring or summer. Uh, the uh, ones that are particularly vulnerable, the pears and the uh, list that I had of the apples, do them as soon as you can. Others can be done later in the summer, but be sure to go back and check again in the winter months. Um, if you don't uh, stop it in the branches uh, where the infection occurred, it's going to continue to spread. If it reaches the main trunk of your tree, the tree is going to die uh, and you're going to have to uh, remove it and replace it. Um, if you've had uh, a situation with particularly bad fire blight in your trees, in addition to doing the pruning that I've recommended, you can also use a copper fungicide spray during the spring time bloom. Uh, so those same 8% metallic uh, equivalent of copper, uh, that's what you wanna look for. And you would be applying it in the springtime after the blossoms are open and when your average temperature for the day is 60 degrees or higher. 
So if it's 50 degrees at night, 70 degrees during the daytime, the average of that nighttime low and the and the high is 60 degrees, that's when you start the spraying and then you spray at four to five day intervals. This is during uh, the bloom. And remember I told you it's going to be the pollinators that come in and spread it uh, from one area of a tree or from one tree uh, to another tree by visiting the blossoms. Uh, that's why you are spraying uh, uh, during the blooming season. Uh, be aware that it can cause uh, russeting on the fruit, uh, but this is just a, a blemish. It, uh, the spray that's hitting the blossoms is causing the russeting uh, perfectly safe to eat the apple or pear, even though it's got the russeting on it. If you don't like the way it looks, uh, just go ahead and peel it. Uh, if you're uh, wanting to uh, grow uh, uh, pears uh, or apples and you want to reduce the chances of having uh, fire blight in the trees, you can choose more resistant varieties. Uh, no pear varieties are going to be fully resistant, but some are better than others. Uh, I've listed some of the Asian pears by name here. Um, it's also on the handout for the webinar. Uh, and uh, the handout includes a link that will take you to uh, uh, United States Department of Agriculture uh, document that uh, shows you European pear varieties with some resistance. And also there is on the handout a link to Cornell's list of apple trees with resistance. Again, it's not uh, an assurance you'll never get it, but it's less likely uh, to be a problem and spread rapidly in the tree. Okay, so we're gonna deal with the final of the diseases that I'm talking about tonight. And I'm not uh, covering certainly by any means all of the potential diseases of fruit trees, uh, but I took a look at our help desk archives and, and found the ones that seem to be the most prevalent and cause the most questions. So the one we're gonna talk about now uh, is called shot hole or coroneum blight. It's another fungal disease. Uh, it particularly infects uh, apricots, uh, peaches, and nectarines, uh, but it can, uh, particularly in uh, uh, a weather conditions that are very rainy, it can also affect your cherry and plum trees. Uh, so this particular disease is fungal in nature, uh, again, the uh, is caused by spores, and in a minute we'll talk about where they overwinter. Uh, but the spores uh, hit the leaves; uh, they'll cause uh, uh, dark reddish or purplish marks on the leaves, and then that uh, dark area eventually falls out. It leaves holes in the leaves, and that's why uh, this disease is commonly known as shot hole disease. Uh, in addition to uh, affecting the leaves and causing the holes, uh, this particular disease is also going to uh, show up on um, fruit that has become infected. You can see it on the young apricots that are on the tree. Uh, it can easily be confused with two other non-infectious disorders that aren't uh, as problematic, aren't really going to uh, be uh, a bad uh, situation for your tree. One is called fog spot. Uh, kind of looks like the uh, coroneum blight or uh, shot hole on the apricots. This is similar to uh, what I showed on the last slide, but this particular one is non-infectious. There's no um, living organism that's causing it. It's environmental. Uh, it's abiotic uh, and it's not going to hurt the uh, fruit. It's not going to damage uh, the, the fruit. So if you're seeing spotting on your apricots, uh, but you're not uh, seeing the associated holes in the leaves, uh, you don't have the fungal disease and you don't have to do anything about it. 
It also, uh, here's another one that's easily confused. Uh, I have a plum tree that gets this every year. Uh, the leaves show a lot of holes, uh, but it doesn't affect the fruit in any way. This is non-infectious. Uh, there's some belief that it may actually be a genetic uh, trait of uh, some plum trees, uh, or it might be environmental. Uh, but it's it's really not harmful for the fruit. Uh, but it does make sense when you see the leaves doing this uh, to go ahead and prune them off the tree. But it shouldn't uh, uh, affect the fruit. It shouldn't uh, spread to other areas of the of the tree. It's not really a disease. But let's talk about the actual disease. Uh, in this case, the shot hole again a fungal disease. Uh, the uh, fungal spores are going to overwinter in buds and twigs that have become infected. You may see a little uh, gumming on them. Uh, that's a common reaction uh, to disease uh, and a little scarring on them. So if you see that, uh, just be aware that there are fungal spores there and they can actually germinate even during the winter time, uh, particularly um, in wet conditions. Uh, but in the springtime in particular, if you leave them untreated, uh, those spores that remain in those infected uh, twigs uh, are going to spread. They're going to uh, reinfect the leaves. They have the potential of spreading to the fruit. So to manage this disease, uh, when the leaves come off, get rid of them. Uh, they're gonna have uh, spores. And then also uh, take a close look at the tree. You're gonna wanna uh, prune out uh, all of the uh, infected uh, areas, the buds and twigs where you see any oozing going on or any uh, lesions, uh, uh, as shown in the um, photograph. Uh, you want to prune those out. And just remember that both apricot and cherry trees uh, can have uh, this disease. And any pruning that you do needs to be done this month to avoid eutypa. It would be a little harder to find uh, the infected areas because you still got leaves on the tree but take a look and try to prune it out so you eliminate that as a source of reinfection for next year. Uh, and then if you've had a particularly uh, bad situation uh, with uh, the disease, uh, this is another opportunity during the uh, dormant season uh, to use a copper fungicide spray uh, wait until the leaves have fallen after you've uh, picked up all the leaves and, and all the infected bugs and twig buds and twigs are gone. Uh, in the winter months, uh, go ahead and spray with the copper spray. If you had a particularly bad uh, uh, disease problem last year, and we have another rainy uh, winter uh, this year, you can also do a second copper spray. Uh, this one, you have a choice of time. Uh, you can do it when the buds are there in late winter. That would be probably late January, February timeframe, or you can do it uh, after uh, the tree starts to uh, bloom. Uh, to reduce the risk of uh, the fruits becoming uh, infected again. And now we're ready for those wormy apples. Uh, certainly we all know about wormy apples. Uh, maybe some of us have been lucky enough to not have experienced wormy pears. In part, that's because uh, pears, when they're young on the tree, are very hard. Uh, and it's hard for the uh, worm to get inside the pear. Uh, but as they start to ripen, uh, it can become more of a problem for the pears. Now, I think we've all seen a wormy apple. It'll have a sting on the outside. That's where the uh, uh, larva of the moth that causes this problem 
uh, has gotten into the apple. Uh, it's putting out its excrement, its frass out of the hole. Eventually it will emerge uh, before it pupates to become a moth. Uh, and if you cut off, up uh, one of the apples that uh, has the sting on it, chances are you may even find the larva uh, inside. Uh, so uh, what do you wanna look for? Well, the codling moth is small, it's about a half inch, is kind of gray, is gonna be active uh, in the evening hours, overnight, so you may not see it at all. Uh, it's pretty small. Uh, but the female uh, moth uh, deposits between 30 and 70 eggs uh, after it's mated. Uh, usually in the early spring, it's laying it on uh, the newly emerging leaves. Uh, when the apples come out, uh, it lays it directly on the apple, oftentimes right where it attaches to the tree. Uh, those eggs uh, are tiny. Uh, you probably need some magnification to be able to see them uh, on the leaves. They incubate for between eight and 14 days, depending on temperatures. Uh, then the little larva uh, bores its way inside the apple where it feeds. It's going to feed there for three to four weeks. Uh, then it's going to emerge. Um, it forms a pupa, uh, usually in the debris underneath the tree uh, where uh, the larva pupates and emerges into a moth. So do the math here. We've got uh, on the shortest, we've got eight days after the eggs are laid, uh, three weeks uh, to feed, uh, so that's 11, then two more weeks, 12, 13. Uh, so uh, in less than two months, you're going to have new moths that are emerging. Uh, and it's going to happen all during the summer. And it may take longer. And there may be uh, some moths that are taking the uh, 13 weeks and some that are taking a little bit longer than that. That's why you can continue to get infections uh, uh, all through the uh, summer. So the best uh, protection is really a combination of methods. Uh, there are non-chemical steps you can take. Uh, uh, a very good thing to do is frequently take a look at uh, your developing fruit, look for the stings. If you find it, pick the apple, get it out of your yard. Uh, look in particular if you've got a cluster of apples uh, where two or three apples are growing out of the same spur right together. Oftentimes you'll uh, see the stings right where the stems attach and there may be um, a sting on each of those two or three apples. Uh, so. Uh, keep watching them. Also, if you uh, keep an eye on the ground below your tree, uh, what you want to do is to try to keep it uh, clean of debris. So maybe you'll notice the pupating uh, moths and can get them out at that point. Um, if you uh, have had a real problem uh, with wormy apples, uh, particularly if you've got a big tree, so it's not easy for you to check and remove all the apples that have stings on it, uh, you may just want to take uh, an approach that will save some of the fruit by putting it in bags. Uh, now, the best bags to use are either paper bags. Uh, the photo on the left is uh, one that is on an apple on one of my trees. It's actually a sandwich bag, a paper sandwich bag. It's just a good size. Uh, you want to put it on when the fruits are small. Uh, best to separate uh, any that are growing right together, like you see in the photo, so that you've just got one remaining apple there. Cut a little slit in the bottom of the uh, bag, uh, put it over that very small apple, uh, then staple the other end shut. Uh, you can also use uh, cotton uh, drawstring bags. Uh, the one in the center photo is one that I uh, made myself uh, with an old sheet, old cotton sheet. Uh, you can also buy them online, uh, but don't uh, 
by the ones that are nylon netting netted uh, bags. Uh, they don't work. Uh, so uh, don't just uh, do your uh, search on a search engine for fruit protection bags. Uh, look for something more specific like cotton drawstring bags, and you'll be able to find some small ones that can be reused from year to year, uh, easy to put on because you just use the drawstring uh, over the apple to attach them. Just be sure that if you've got uh, your apples bagged, uh, you don't have to bag all of them in the tree, but you might still want to try uh, to keep an eye out uh, for any apples with stings and take the bags off uh, about uh, two weeks before you think it's going to be time to uh, hire or to uh, harvest them. Uh, that'll allow the apples to uh, uh, develop a little color. There are also uh, pesticides that you can use um, uh, to protect your trees. Uh, there's two different ones that are uh, suggested by the University of California for home gardeners. Uh, the first is one that is called CYDX. This is um, a biological insecticide. It's actually a virus uh, that is in the uh, pesticide. You spray it on the tree. Uh, when the larva uh, consumes it, uh, it kills them. Uh, and it only affects uh, the larva of the coddling moth. Uh, so sounds pretty good, right? Uh, the downside is it's hard to find. Um, uh, this is a photo that I uh, took from an online uh, site. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, it's been marked down. Uh, currently costs $165 instead of $175. It's a six ounce uh, bottle. Uh, it's only going to uh, last a short while. If you put it in your refrigerator, you'll be able to keep it for about a year so maybe you can get uh, this season or next year when uh, you buy it a little earlier in the season, maybe you'll get one season and part of another, but it doesn't last a long time. And if you don't refrigerate it, it's only going to last about three months uh, and then you're going to have to replace it. Uh, there is another one, uh, and this one is... Uh, more widely available. Again, I'm not recommending any particular brands. These are just ones that I could easily uh, find pictures of. What you're going to be looking at uh, uh, in this case, looking for, is the active ingredient. So read your label. You're looking for spinosad. It's again a, a biological product. Uh, this pesticide is made from a naturally occurring bacteria. Uh, also uh, will kill the uh, larva of the coddling moth uh, when it consumes it. Uh, this one has a moderate risk to bees. Uh, so if you uh, spray this one, uh, do, it, uh, do it in the evening. Uh, that's the best time. You could do it in the morning, but it's going to uh, stay a problem if it's on the blossoms that uh, the bees are visiting uh, until it dries. Once it dries uh, on the blossoms, it's no longer a risk. And the best way to uh, ensure that that's gonna happen is uh, find uh, a time in the evening to do your spraying uh, towards dark uh, when the bees are no longer active uh, that will allow the overnight hours uh, to dry it, and it will no longer pose the risk to, um, to the bees. Uh, so proper timing is critical. Remember those larvae are uh, uh, hatching out. They are tiny when they first hatch out. You've got to get the spray onto the surfaces of the apple before uh, the uh, larva has been able to uh, bore into the apple. Once it's inside, it's protected and the spray is not gonna do any good. 
So what you need to figure out is when are the moths active? Uh, when are they showing up? Uh, so in about March, uh, you wanna hang a pheromone trap in your tree. Uh, the pheromone uh, is a female uh, sex pheromone. Uh, it attracts the male moths. Uh, you put it on a sticky uh, trap and hang it in your tree. That way you check it every day. You know when the uh, males are showing up attracted by the pheromone and get uh, stuck on the uh, sticky surface. Uh, you know that the moths are active. Uh, and then uh, you're gonna wait until egg hatch time. And a few slides back, I told you that that's 10 to 15 days. It usually, um, the easiest way is about a month after bloom, look for the first stings. So you're gonna sacrifice uh, a few apples, but as soon as you see the sting showing up about a month after bloom, uh, that's when you would start your spray. Uh, if you wanna be more exact and try to get it just right, uh, there is a what's called the degree day calculator. The handout has a link to it. Uh, and it has good instructions on the link that will tell you how to uh, figure out more precisely just when uh, the hatch is going to occur based on your daytime temperature and your per particular uh, location. Uh, this is another one where uh, adding the uh, horticultural oil is going to make it more effective both for the CDYX, the expensive one, and for Spinosat. Usually CYND, uh, the, the first one, the expensive one doesn't harm bees, uh, but if you add the oil, uh, it becomes harmful for the bees. So again, spray in the evening hours, uh, so uh, it will have a chance to dry overnight before the bees show up in the morning. And here's the other use for spraying that uh, horticultural oil. It's to kill overwintering uh, pests on your tree. Uh, a couple of insect pests, uh, aphids on the left uh, photo. Uh, if you have a fruit tree, there is a kind of aphid that will attack it. Uh, scale uh, in the uh, center fo photo, uh, the aphid is, in this case, is a uh, green peach aphid, uh, but your green peach aphid uh, can also show up on your vegetable crops. Uh, spinach and potatoes are uh, vegetables that that green peach uh, uh, aphid attacks. The uh, center photo is San Jose scale. Uh, it's the most uh, damaging scale for apples, but it also affects pears and all of your stone fruits. So your apricots, your peaches, anything that has a stone in it. And then on the right, um, that's a spider mite. Uh, it's uh, actually not an insect because uh, spider mite is a spider. It's in the arachnid family. Uh, but let's talk about life cycles of these pests because it will help inform why dormant spraying can work. Uh, if you watch John Fike's webinar uh, two months ago, back in June, called Good Bug, uh, Bad Bug, he called aphids the Cheetos of the insect world because they're so numerous. And one of the reasons that they're so numerous is that a single female uh, can lay live offspring up to 12 per day. And that's why they multiply on your plants so quickly. Uh, the uh, female uh, aphids that do that don't have to mate. Uh, they don't even have wings. That's why spraying aphids off your tree often uh, is a good thing to do in the springtime conditions because they can't fly back. Uh, but they have an overwintering strategy uh, where both females and male aphids begin to develop wings and they mate and they lay eggs uh, instead of giving live birth. And where do the eggs show up? 
Uh, they're in the tree bark or on the buds of your fruit trees. Uh, in fact, that uh, aphid, uh, the green peach aphid that will attack your vegetables, uh, it wants to overwinter on your peach tree. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it is going to show up on the buds. Uh, similarly, uh, the life cycle of scale, uh, the, this is uh, a photo of a mature female right in the center of the slide. This is the San Jose scale, which is common on all of your fruit trees that we're talking about tonight. Uh, the female lays eggs. They're protected under uh, kind of a hard covering. Uh, they're actually not mobile insects at this point. They are very stationary, uh, but the eggs develop under a hard covering. Uh, these, uh, the scale is going to uh, be harmful to uh, your plants because it's sucking the uh, sugars out of it. It's probably uh, creating uh, some uh, mold, black sooty mold, et cetera. It's attracting uh, ants. Uh, but when it's laying its eggs, they get protected. Uh, then they're going to go through two uh, uh, levels of maturity. Uh, first, they're what's called an early crawler. Uh, they are oftentimes, uh, particularly for the San Jose scale, they're yellow in color. These are going to be able to move around on your tree to move to new locations. Uh, and then a later development stage is the stage at which they're going to overwinter on your tree. It's called the black cap uh, stage. Uh, so these are immature. They're not yet uh, fully able to reproduce. Uh, that will come later, but during the winter months, uh, they're going to be in that black cap stage of development on the surfaces of your tree. And then finally, the life cycle of spider mites. Uh, they are spiders. Um, you'll see uh, they also are going to cause a lot of stippling on your leaves, uh, uh, kind of make them uh, look, you know, some dark areas, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, their life stage is uh, from an egg to a larva, two nymph stages, and then an adult. And guess what that do adult does uh, to ensure that uh, her offspring are going to survive the winter? Uh, she lays eggs uh, on the tree itself around the buds. Uh, during the growing season, she's laying her eggs on the leaves uh, because that's where the young larvae are going to feed. Uh, but the leaves are going to fall off the tree. So the overwintering strategy is to lay the eggs uh, directly on the tree surfaces, often around the uh, buds that are going to become. Uh, leaves or flowers uh, the following spring. Uh, so given that overwintering, uh, winter is a good time to use a spray oil. Uh, they come by lots of different names. And again, we're not particularly recommending uh, any uh, particular brand. Any of the oils uh, will work. The label might say it's horticultural oil, insecticidal oil, dormant oil. They go by a lot of different names. Uh, what their active ingredient is, is, is either a plant-based oil. You may be familiar with neem oil. It's very common, oftentimes used uh, uh, to smother insects during the summer. Uh, you could use that for dormant uh, uh, season. Uh, if it's not plant-based, it may be um, a petroleum product. Uh, both of them work. Uh, they work by contacting either the insects. Uh, so in the case of the scale, uh, they're uh, smothering uh, the developing insect, or in the case of both the aphids um, and the uh, spider mites, they're uh, uh, smothering uh, the eggs, uh, which keeps it from developing. 
uh, dormant sprays, uh, low risk to beneficial insects. The reason is uh, that they're overwintering on the tree. Uh, they're not uh, small insects that are going to uh, be attracting the beneficials. The beneficials won't be there during the winter months, so it, uh, low risk. Also, low risk to you and me and other mammals like our pets. Uh, it won't harm uh, water quality to use a dormant spray. Uh, there are issues from bees. So again, spray it in the evening when the bees aren't active. Give it some time to uh, dry. Uh, for the dormant season, uh, you're going to want to wait until the leaves are off the tree. Hopefully you've cleaned them all up to prevent disease. Then you're going to pick a clear day. Uh, with little wind because you don't want the spray to be blowing around um, in the January time, February time frame. Uh, watch the weather forecast. You want the uh, oil to be able to do its job and remain on the tree uh, for a few days. Uh, so be sure it's not going to uh, rain. Also be sure it's at least 50 degrees. Uh, that helps the oil spread. Uh, and fills up the crevices on the tree. And don't spray if it's going to freeze overnight. Uh, for all the spraying that we have talked about today, whether it's dormant uh, oils or uh, any of the uh, copper fungicides, uh, figure out what kind of a spraying device you need by the size of your tree. If you've got a very young tree that's small, you might uh, be able to use just a hand sprayer. You might want something with a larger volume. Uh, if uh, you've got a larger tree or multiple trees, uh, be sure you read and follow the label instructions. If you are spraying copper sprays, be aware that if they get into your soil, they can kill the beneficial microorganisms in your soil. Also, they can get into groundwater. So if you're using any of the copper spray remedies that we've talked about tonight, you might want to put down a ground cloth, uh, do your spraying. Uh, in order to be effective, either the oil sprays or the copper sprays have to really well cover the surfaces of the tree. If you've got peach leaf curl and you're spraying for that, it should literally be dropping off the tree. So put a ground cloth down first, let it dry before you pick it up uh, and be sure you are wearing appropriate uh, protective clothing. You probably need to have uh, some anti-splash goggles to keep it out of your eyes uh, and other protective gear uh, and be sure you do thorough coverage. So we've covered a lot of information uh, the uh, YouTube of this webinar uh, will be available uh, by tomorrow on our website and within a couple of days on the library's website. So if you want to watch anything, again, you can take a look for that. Uh, but also on the um, handout uh, for the webinar, I've got links to uh, all of the University of California's discussions of these uh, diseases and pests. Everything that I've said today is based on UC researched information. And so you can read it for yourself on the links that I'll provide. Uh, and now it's time to develop an action plan. What should you be doing in the next couple of weeks? Uh, prune your apricot and cherry trees. Uh, check for any cankers or oozing on apricot and cherry trees, because if you're finding that, and if you suspect a possible eutypa infection, uh, it, you want to get it pruned out of the tree um, uh, before the end of the month. Uh, also, monitor uh, fruits on apples and pear trees. Uh, if you've got ones that have still got stings on them, get them out of there because uh, it'll start reducing uh, the codling moth uh, population. Uh, check apples and pear trees. Uh, good time if you have had fire blight and haven't tried pruning it already. Uh, it's a good time to do that pruning now. 
Just be sure you check again in the winter uh, for anything you've missed and then take our survey. Uh, that'll get you the handout. And I've included on the handout an action plan with recommended steps to take all the rest of the fall, winter, and spring to manage uh, the diseases and pests that we've talked about tonight. And here is a link. And I believe in the uh, chat, there is a link as well uh, to the survey that will get you uh, access to our uh, handout. 